Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today's episode, very, very excited to share with you. This is something that we've been working towards for quite some time, and uh, you're in for a treat. If you have, if this is your first time watching or listening to the podcast, then welcome. Uh, you have joined at the right time. Jesse Cole is our guest today. He's the owner of the Savannah Bananas. He's also the author of a book called Find Your Yellow Tuxedo. And it's this is an exciting conversation with a lot of practical information. So get ready to take notes. So grab a notebook alongside of your cup of coffee and get ready for this conversation. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. Sipping on lattes, and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh, yeah. All right, Jesse, thank you for being on the podcast today. As we do with every guest, is rapid fire five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with unknown point values. Uh, so it's a it's something that we're shooting for. Are you ready to go? So the rules don't matter. Let's do it. There, there are the rules or there are no rules. Number one, okay. if you could only wear one type of shoe for the rest of your life, what type of shoe would it be? Uh, yellow, a yellow shoe, just a yellow <laughs> shoe. I don't care. Yellow it's, shoe. Go. It has to be a type of shoe. All right. I'm going to go a yellow. Uh, the ones I've been wearing now, I hate going brand names. This is tough. Reebok. Fine. Reebok. That's the ones I'm wearing now. Move yellow on. Reebok shoes. Got it. Number two, what game show would be you be super awesome at? Oh, geez. Game show, game show, game show. Um, the first one that came to mind is Price is Right. Okay. Why? No, no reason at all. That's the first one that came to mind. I think I just bring the energy and maybe Bob Barker, former Bob Barker would have let me. Uh, let's move on. Next question. You're really embracing this rapid fire. Most, yes, people, most people take uh, and, and drag it out. So this is this No, is no, no. Exciting. It's first come to mind. Number three, if you could eliminate one thing from your daily routine, what would it be and why? Looking on my phone. Huh, that's interesting. Okay. Number four, what's the last time you tried something new? <laughs> the big things I've gone, uh, I went surfing this year. I went skeet shooting, things that I've never done. But last time I tried something new, jeez, um, uh, it's probably some type of food item. I had alligator. Um, yeah, I've had some, it's probably weird food items. I try things uh, or craft beer, big into craft beer. I always try unique beer Okay. So every day, you know, or every day, every time I go to a brewery, every day I'm constantly trying new craft beers. Moving on, Chad, you're really throwing me off here. Let's keep, <laughs> keep this moving. Number you're five, at me here. number five, what activity makes you lose track of time? Ooh, um, uh, that's easy. Anytime, uh, I'm in the bananas world. So whether I'm putting on a show at our field, whether I'm on the field with fans, whether I'm speaking in front of a group or on a podcast like this, except when we're doing rapid fire, I lose track. <laughs> there you go. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> you made it through five questions. We're going to give you a score of a thousand and twenty two because yes. you really embraced the rapid portion of rapid fire. So congratulations. Thanks. That's a very valid score. I'm, I'm going to throw five rapid fire on you one of these days and see what happens. Here we go. <laughs> That's not how this program works. All oh, right. okay. All right. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you very much for joining us, by the way. I, I want to tell a quick story of, of kind of how we arrived here yeah. uh, because I think it's really cool. And this has happened very few times for me um, over, over the course of time. But um, I had, we were just talking about this before we started recording, but um, I'd heard your name come up in the Savannah Bananas come up multiple times through several different books that I've listened to and read. And I think the first reference was a Jay Bear reference. And so it just kept ho popping up. I was on vacation this past Christmas and I was listening to uh, a book by Mike Michalowicz, Profit First. And I basically had dedicated, I was going to get through this on this vacation. And I know that's not a good practice because you're not supposed to do business books while you're on vacation. But anyway, and I was, I'd spent a lot of time running on a treadmill and I was running on a treadmill this is all irrelevant information, but I like to put it in there to color <laughs> the story. I was, I was r running on a treadmill, uh, facing sideways, staring at the ocean, going up and down. And, uh, and, and the, your reference to the Savannah Bananas and Jesse Cole and the fact that you guys had implemented Profit First and it revolutionized your business. And I was just like, all right, something's going on with this guy. I got to figure this out. And you came up in some type of a feed for mine on LinkedIn. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to reach out and see, would he be interested in having a conversation? And I sent you a message and you responded almost immediately. And I was like, holy 
holy crap, this this is cool. So uh, I would appreciate you um, making an effort and uh, to respond to when people reach out to you because that's not common these days. Um, and then obviously giving us some time to have a good conversation today. No, I'm fired up to be with you. I, I think it's something I learned, you know, when I was 25 years old and I read Mark Cuban's book and I, I shot him an email and he responded back within an hour. And I was like, Mark Cuban, you know, he wrote back. And I think, you know, um, the, I have a belief in growing fans uh, and growing relationships one person at a time. And I'm, I'm passionate about this. And I'm a Dave Matthews band fan. And I've, I just shared something today, actually, about Dave Matthews and how their goal was to play at every club to every person around America. Where there were no albums out, they were just trying to make a fan at a time. And uh, I think when people reach out, if I can just talk and uh, talk to them and help them out in any way and just be with you, man, I'm, I'm excited already, even though I'm thrown off still by the rapid fire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving past that. <laughs> the, the, the really cool thing, a couple of uh, I don't even remember a couple of months back, there was a guy that I reached out to on Instagram, uh, Brian Parsley, and mm -hmm. same kind of conversation. I was like, hey, this would be a great guy to have on the podcast. He's a keynote speaker and all this stuff. And he had his contact information on his Instagram account. So I just hit the phone number on there. I was like, I'm going to talk to his secretary and I'm going to have to go through this process. And he answers the phone. Hey, what's up? And I'm like, is this Brian? He was like, yeah. And I was like, uh, I don't, I wasn't prepared for this. I wasn't prepared for you to actually answer the phone. So I, I think when you do that, it makes a big impression. Well, at our stadium in Savannah, uh, our cell phone, myself and my wife's cell phone is posted right in the fan services in our cell phone and our email for all 100,000 fans, every fan that comes in the ballpark. And I think it's so important to be accessible. And I think everyone tries to hide behind gatekeepers. And you know what? A real conversation goes a long way. And if, if someone, a fan has a challenge or, or question or suggestion, we'll take it. And we, we look forward to it. So I think it's a, it's a good leadership principle that I've learned over the years. Just be available when you can. Very cool. I want to jump into a, several points of conversation that hopefully we can get through in the time allotted. Um, I, I just, I feel like, I feel like this is going to be a fun conversation. So if anybody that's listening or watching for the first time, like I think you've, you've captured a, a great conversation today. And at some point in time, my four-year-old little son is going to ask me how I got a hold of the guy in the yellow suit um, and had a conversation with him because he watches Curious George. So this will be fun as well. Perfect. So, all right, you're in a yellow suit, and I'm going to ignore that for now. We'll talk about that later, but it's, it's all part of, part of uh, the process. And so just high level, you're, you're the owner of the Savannah Bananas. What is that? <laughs> it's it's one of the lowest level baseball teams in the entire country and so for people that know sports and major league baseball you got up here you got triple a baseball here double a here high a regular a low a i'm going down lower for the people listening independent baseball college baseball and then we are the bottom all right we're just college summer baseball where players come to hopefully develop during the summer and play professional baseball and uh yeah it's a low level baseball team that i never shared with anybody when we first started but since we turned it into a circus and all about entertainment and five years ago, my wife and I having to sell our house and empty out our savings account because we only sold two total tickets in the first three months in Savannah to then uh, selling out every single game. And we have a wait list for tickets in the thousands and it's become much more national and global and we are blown away. So now I'm proud to say that we are one of the lowest level baseball teams. But yes, <laughs> we have a break dancing first base coach at every game. We have a senior citizen dance team called the Banana Nanas with women in their 70s that literally dance Justin Timberlake on the field. We have a male cheerleading team called the Mananas, and they're now just referred to as the Dad Bod Cheerleading Squad. We have a 20 piece pep pan at every single game. Our players do choreographed dances. They're a part of the circus. Um, it's a baseball game where baseball is the sideshow. The circus is the first focus. That was, that was what I was getting ready to say is everything that you just laid out had nothing to do with baseball. And then you, you kind of landed it there, obviously, uh, well prepared. That is one of the intriguing things about this. And I think when I first heard about it was part of a talk triggers conversation, probably with Jay Bear, where he was saying, you know, this is kind of the thing that you've built is people are talking about what's happening outside of the game of baseball. I've talked about it a lot on, on this podcast and in other conversations. I'm not a baseball fan. I, baseball is boring to me um, and it's painful to watch, right? And it's something that you have kind of embraced. And, and even in your book, you talk about that. It's, it, is, it is perceived as boring and it's even kind of on the decline. So what do we do to kind of bring some excitement back to it, uh, which, which is, is very admirable? Well, I think you got to know what business you're in, but what business are you really in? And when you're the lowest level of baseball, we're never going to win that game. We're not going to be like, hey, should I go see the Atlanta Braves or the Yankees or see uh, the college summer baseball team? But when you're playing a different game, 
Yeah. See, we're, we think we can create the greatest show in sports and we believe that and it doesn't have to do with the baseball. And so we started focusing on that. And then obviously we attract the non-baseball fans. When someone says, oh man, I hate baseball. I go, perfect. You'll love our shows. You know, that's the response because I heard it. So yeah. look at what other friction points you have in your industry. We had so many friction points, baseball, long, slow and boring. You get nickel and dimed, eliminate those and go the other way. And that's, you know, really helped us after struggling in the beginning. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about 3,422 times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home, because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDoc.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDoc Security, helping you protect your people and your property. Why did you write a book? <laughs> Mike Michalowicz. Okay. You know, it's, it's actually, you know, it's actually funny. Um, so after we saved our business and, you know, we were sleeping on an airbed, uh, living on $30 a week, trying to eat food at Walmart, which... Chad, it's not even real food. You know, when you're getting 30, it's like, it, like Hot Pockets is like a delicacy. Like, like I was like, woo, Hot Pockets this week. Yeah. Um, it was, that was five years ago. We were really struggling. And um, so I read a whole chapter in the, the first version of the book that said, you need to enjoy saving more than spending. And we looked at every single way to save. And we saved on everything to try to get us out of that hole. And so I, uh, when we got out of the hole and sold out every game and my wife and I were able to get a real bed, which was big time, I wrote Mike a thank you letter. And uh, he immediately called me. He called me and said, Jesse, Jesse. And I've had some funny calls too. Like, like Simon Sinek called me out of the blue after I wrote him a thank you letter. And I told him, I go, shut up. This is not Simon Sinek. And he goes, like, I've had some really weird calls in the days. But uh, Mike called me and he was like, man, this is amazing. Can you jump on my podcast? And I said, yeah. And I shared the story. He's like, oh my God, Jesse, can you be the keynote speaker at our, at our conference? I was like, sure, man. And I was like, when is it? He's like, I don't know. He's like, it's this day. Come on. I was like, all right. So I showed up and I gave the keynote speech and it was all financial people, accountant people. Mm. I mean, people that a guy in a yellow tuxedo that runs a baseball team should never speak to. All right. And uh, I was so fortunate. I, I shared our journey, shared what we did, ha- how we stood out, how we did things differently. Yep. And I got a very long standing ovation and I walked off the stage and Mike said, you need to write this in a book. And so that became find your yellow tux, how to be successful by standing out. And I shared just the journey about, you know, I, that book wrote, I wrote that book three years ago and now it's still making an impact and it's, it's been really cool, but it was the inspiration of one person to say, all right, Hey, let's do this. And accountants cheering for this story, which I was like, all right, if we got through to the accounting world, this may be something. It, it's, it's an interesting book and I'm, I'm probably uh, transparently about halfway through it and I've got a, a whole kind of section here of highlighted information that stood out to me. And, I, and, it, and that was the reason why I was asking, why did you write a book? Because there's a lot of principles in here that you can find in other areas, you can find in other books, but it is very much a practical story. And this is not a in 1983 when I figured out how to do this. This is three years ago, right? The, like mm. you just said, five years, this is real, almost real time, um, a real time book. And it is, so it is a very practical understanding of, of, of the, the ways to build a business, the ways to find and understand and then develop as a leader. And that's really, at least for the first part of the book that I'm in right now, the first half, it is significantly more about finding yourself as a leader and less about actually building a business is that kind of the direction build yourself build your business build your legacy so the whole section second section is all about building the business and the third one is about building your legacy so i started with the leader the individual and then moved from there and why is that important to start with the person Mm -hmm. yeah i mean in our fans first playbook and the name of our company is fans first entertainment but previously it was called team colon associates which town sounds like a terrible law firm all right and it wasn't about us (laughs) But again, who, do you, who are you for? Who do you stand for? What are you about? And so we are all about the fans. And the reason why we made baseball more fast, more exciting is because it's too long, too boring, and fans don't like it. Mm-hmm. There's reason why we eliminated all of the nickel and diming at a ballpark. I mean, Chad, you've probably been to a stadium. You're in Charlotte. All right, you get seven bucks for this, eight bucks for a burger, nine bucks for this. And all of a sudden, you're like, what did I 
just spend all this money on? So we made every ticket all inclusive. All your burgers, your hot dogs, your chicken sandwiches, your soda, your water, your popcorn, everything with your ticket for $18 total. Yep. And so the idea was look at all the friction points. We named the company Fans First Entertainment. Our mission is fans first, entertain always. Every decision we make, is it fans first? You talk about intentionality before this call. We just talk about that. So that's the, the way our company was built. And what we believe inside our fans first playbook, we have what we call the three loves. Love your customers more than you love your product. Love your team and your people more than you love your customers. And finally, you got to love yourself above all. If you don't love yourself and take care of yourself, you can't be best for your people, your team, or your customers. And so I started with the leader first because I realized that when I started, I was not a good leader. I was a 23 year old that was given the keys to a team in Gastonia, North Carolina, the worst performing team in the entire country, 200 fans coming to the games. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. I had to get myself in a good spot to know how I could be my best and how I could start my morning on purpose, have gratitude, have, you know, literally have a plan and how I write, how I read, how I learn. And then I can show up every day and do my best for others. So that's why I start with that. Hey, what are you doing? You got to be the best at what you're doing. You got to become a sponge. You got to really learn and embrace things from outside your industry and then really own it and go all in and amplify that. And that's the really how my journey works. And I've seen it work with others as well. All right. So you, you've already tapped into a couple of my points and questions that I wanted to get to being a sponge. So uh, dive into that a little bit more because yeah, maybe it's very obvious. What, what, are, you, what are you referring to when you're saying being a sponge? I'll take it the other level. I mean, being a sponge, very obvious, is like, like, you know, learn, embrace, get out of your comfort zone to learn. And I, I think it's very easy. Oh, I'm, I'm learning from my industry. Learn from outside your industry. And again, the fact that you have a crazy guy in a yellow tuxedo with you today, it's like, yeah, there's no one probably in your industry that's like this. But I got that so much from Howard Schultz. I mean, the fact that literally he went all the way overseas, went to a completely different world to start saying, all right, this is what the coffee community looks like. This wasn't happening in the United States. And for us, we learn from Carnival Cruise. We learn from Disney. I don't go to any sporting events because you become the best in practice. You're just really a me too anyways. Mm. How do you become the only, not just a little better, a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, a little bit more convenient. That was how we try to learn. That's why, you know, there's no baseball team in the country that has every single ticket all inclusive. There's no team that has a break dancing first base coach or has a male cheerleading team or has any of these stuff because we want to be the only. And so I think be a sponge is to get outside of just learning from your peers, but learn from people all outside. And that's why my biggest impact and uh, my biggest uh, mentors are P.T. Barnum, Walt Disney, and Bill Beck. And P.T. Barnum and Walt Disney, man, you could, uh, you, the amount of books written about them, they, they should keep writing them because there's so much to learn from what, what they did. All right, so I want to bounce. I want to come back to the be a sponge thing, but I want to take a quick diversion side road because Bridget. that's pretty Let's much what, what this is all about. All-inclusive tickets. So you just said, and I've, I'm, I'm taking notes here because this is good information. Remove friction points. Uh, and, and because of that, I've been having lots of conversations in our business about removing friction points. So yes. hopefully you can help me validate some points and give me some additional points to talk about. But you give an all-inclusive ticket to a baseball game where your typical model for a business in the sports entertainment world is the ticket to get them in, put them in the seat, we make our money on all of the other things that we're going to get them to buy. Yes. How in the world have you broken through that mindset that that is the business model that we, that's our business model, that's, that's our industry's business model. How do, we, how do you change it to say, come in, all inclusive, whatever you want? So I think it started for us is I put ourselves, I put myself in my customer shoes and we actually do this, Chad. So we actually have undercover fan where every night at our stadium, one of our front office staff will go undercover. We'll park with the fans. We'll walk in with the fans. We'll sit with the fans. We'll eat with the fans. We have probably over the last three years, a hundred page of notes of putting ourselves in their shoes. And what we focus on is what are those friction points? And I remember two years ago, I actually parked and I hit a giant pothole and my car bottomed out. I was like, that is not a good experience, especially for the owner to experience coming in. But I didn't know that because I never parked with a fan before. So again, your company or any co anybody that's listening, think about yourself. What are all the friction points from the buying experience, the website experience, the phone call experience, the delivery experience, the after experience, the last impression? What are all of it? And from the industry as a whole, for instance, a law firm, does anybody love being billed in five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute increments? There's a huge opportunity for disruption because it's like, I want to call my lawyer, but I know this five minute call is going to cost me $150. And so that's the same model that I thought of with baseball. It's like, 
No one wants to go to a state and pay 10 bucks for this. The idea of taking your wallet out of your, your pocket over and over again, no one likes that. No one will ever like that. The cruise industry figured that out. You know, literally you get your credit card, you buy the cruise and you can get your food whenever you want. You can get your entertainment whenever you want. No one likes that. So we said, what would it be like to do it the exact opposite? We had no idea. We said, what would be a good number? At first it was $15 our first year. We said, all right, $15, let's do it. And she had the first night, 4,000 people, sold out crowd. It took people six to seven innings to actually get their food. The lines were outrageous. We had no idea how to serve all you can eat. We didn't know that we were going to go through 10,000 pieces of meat in an hour. Yeah. We had no idea. But the next night got better. And next night got better. Now everyone gave fed within five minutes. So we looked at a giant friction point, mm -hmm. which is the idea of getting nickel and dimed and making it a better experience and said, all right, what is something that the value is so hot? Mm -hmm. And how can you create a product and experience that your customers feel like they're taking advantage of you? Yeah. That's what we try to create. Which I get that part of it. So here's my yes. challenge back on it. And as I'm trying to wrap through it is the, 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 the pundits will say, well, yes. what about the customers that are taking advantage of it? The ones yes. that actually do take you up on all you can eat and just stand there and eat all the food that they can actually celebrate eat. them, highlight them on your social media. But look at this guy. He had eight burgers, six hot dogs. Let's get him some Pepto Bismol. Like, you know, like celebrate him. Like literally, like that's what we do We're, on our podcast uh, last year. Whenever we got a bad review, our bad review was like, this is like a circus. You got Willy Wonka running around. The music's too loud. It's too loud. We make them the review of the week, the fan of the week. We highlight the bad reviews because they're actually saying what we are. Yeah. And you need to know who you are not for more than you're for. So, but Jed, uh, Chad, I love behind you. He says, always improving. Mm -hmm. You always need to find those next, what I call mirror moments. Yep. Look in the mirror, look at yourself in the industry and find out what do you need to change. You're laughing. Where are you going? Well, do you have a camera over my shoulder with all of my notes here? Is that what is, is that? <laughs> Maybe that's where you're going, but but I, I guess here where I'm, where I'm going with this is we had a mirror moment this past year. Yep. I, I realized and our staff realized no one in the world wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to be sold today. I hope someone will advertise something to me today. Oh, I want to get marketed to and promoted today. Yet, you know, where do baseball teams make most of their money? With ads everywhere, mm -hmm. billboards, announcements, program ads. They will advertise anything. Look what's happening in the NBA and all. We'll put ads. People are going to start getting ad tattoos on their face. Like, oh, Nike's on your face now. Like, that's what's going to happen. It's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. So we said, let's go the opposite. So on February 25th this year, which put in context of, of COVID, two weeks before the pandemic, we announced we created the first ever ad free stadium. We eliminated every single ad from our ballpark because we don't believe a fan comes to a ballpark and wants to be sold, marketed to, or advertised to. We threw away hundreds of thousands of dollars. What were we thinking? Yep. But we believed it would create more long-term fans. So you need to be able to throw away the way you used to do business mm. to potentially where it's going. And that's what we decided to do. And that's what we've done with everything, with the all-you-can-eat model, the no-ad model, and the nonstop entertainment model. And we've even changed the game of baseball. We, we invented a new game we played this summer in front of fans. So we're going to keep challenging and, and seeing what works. Be willing to throw away the old model. I like that. It's, it, it's, it's easier said than done, obviously. Um, but but I, I definitely like that. All right. So mirror moments. You mentioned it a couple of times, referenced it. What, is, what do you mean when you say mirror moments? So it goes personal or in your business. Um, you know, personal in your bit For personal, it was very quick, easy for me to know. These are the things that frustrate me about what I'm doing in my job. Mm -hmm. And now find the things that give me energy. And something that I created and started sharing with other groups was creating your own energy list. Everyone says, oh, just do what you love, do what you like. No, no, write down the things that give you energy. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I really wrote down, I was like, all right, I love sharing, creating, and growing. Whether I'm sharing what we're doing, whether I'm creating and writing, I'm creating a new video, or whether I'm growing, learning, being a sponge. So if I look at my schedule and I'm not doing that, good luck. And when I first started, I mean, operations at the ballpark, Chad, I have like six left hands. Like it is just terrible. All right. I couldn't put up signs, serve food. I mean, I just, there were so many things I was bad at the ballpark, but I was doing it every day and I was exhausted. I was mm -hmm. putting out fires and we don't want to be a firefighter. We want to do things that we love. So I was doing that nonstop. So yep. personally, I realized mere moment, stop doing the things that frustrate me. Start doing the things that give me energy. Simple. But yeah, we look at your calendar. Most of us are still doing things. That's like, oh, I got to deal with these details. I don't want to do these details. If you're a creator, good luck on details. Yeah. Number two, from a business standpoint, write down all the frustrations of your customer. Put yourself in your customer's shoes, just like we talked about, of the industry as a whole and then of your business. We start big with the industry. 
And then we get to our business. And that's how we started mapping our experience. And literally we map everything from when you first buy a ticket to the thank you call you get. That was the second step. So this has taken 15 years of, of a journey, but it starts with one realizing what really frustrates me and let's pick that out and let's attack it. It's, it's very interesting. So you, you just said a bunch of things and I'm trying to figure out which one to go <laughs> back towards because again, you have, you have, uh, you found all of the, the notes that I have, that I've pulled together, but they're all the things that have stuck out to me in the book so far. Right. So getting back into the, the firefighter. All right. And one of the things that you, you wrote in the book that really jumped out to me and I, I highlighted it is uh, playing the firefighter is neither fulfilling nor sustainable, but being proactive every day, every week, using mirror moments to think about both uh, the things that your business isn't great at and the things that you're not great at in your business. And then instead of throwing yourself into the fire to try to rescue everyone all the time, try thinking about how your team can avoid starting the fire in the first place. Mm-hmm. That, I, that is powerful. I, I actually mentioned this to our leadership team um, and said, hey, that, cause that's a, that's the thing, right? We, we all do that. Not just me, but the leadership team as a whole, like we constantly are going in and fighting fires. Well, if we can spend more time thinking about how to prevent them. And I told him, I said, instead of being the fire, donning our firefighter equipment, let's, uh, let's become Smokey the bear. How can we prevent forest fires? You know, that is, that's the mantra that you need to start thinking about in preventative rather than, uh, than, uh, reactive. And, and that was massive for me. Well, thank you. I think one of the best things to do is just start saying no to more things. If you want to start putting out fire, start saying no to the things that are actually starting the fire. And so, for instance, for us, we were doing events at our stadium and we did tap of the morning beer festival because you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. We did some crazy. You know, we did uh, haunted stadiums. We did all these events, running of the bananas with everyone in banana costumes, tons of events. And what we realized was these were wearing us out. We were having to sell, 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 which no one wants to do. Our team was running around just doing brand new things they've never done before. And we were getting wiped out. And most of our time was spent on those. Were they profitable? Yes, to an extent. We eliminated all of that. And so that's a big degree. But look at what are those things like, what can you eliminate from your day Mm -hmm. that actually causes more stress and fires? And so, yeah, we go in advance, like looking at our operation. I'll just give you one example, Chad. The During our operation, we had to cook so much food in advance for the all you can eat. All right. But what we realized was sometimes the food was cooked a little too early and mm-hmm. it wasn't in, it wasn't the best quality. And one fan showed us a picture this year of a chicken sandwich that looked like a burger. And I was so embarrassed. I posted this. I was like, this is the most I shared this with everyone, yeah. which I was probably silly to do. But I was like, this is embarrassing. We went to the system. We said, why is this happening? And we went back and realized, well, we had to do this by this, that, this, that. I said, all right, well, what if we had an extra grill here? What if we actually grilled fresh at this time? What if we just, we start asking those questions. Those fires don't happen anymore mm-hmm. because literally we're now changing the system that goes into our cooking. And I think that is the upstream thinking as uh, uh, Dan Heath talks about in his newest book, which is so important. It, it, the, other, the other interesting component of that, going back to some of the stuff you were talking about earlier, was about your, your calendar and the amount of time that you're dedicating to the things that are going to, I guess, energize you or bring the most value to your business. And I think Michael Hyatt talks about it a lot of, of basically look at your calendar and that's where your priorities are. And I think that's a really big challenge for, for all of us as business owners is, and leaders is, okay, what am I actually spending my time and energy on? And for me, when, whenever that question was posed to me originally, I looked at my calendar and my calendar was essentially blank <laughs> because I was just, I don't want to block anything on my calendar because I need to be prepared because I don't know what's going to happen. And that is obviously the backwards, backwards mentality of thinking. So then where do you migrate? So then it looks at where are you going to? And all of a sudden you're going to whatever you think needs you the most. Yep. yep. And then that may not be in your sweet spot, your energy list. And that happens to anybody. It's like, oh, I got to jump on this. I got to jump on this because you have that freedom of your schedule. Yeah. And so it can you right backfire. Yeah. And, and you're basically just at that point chasing it. You're, you're just chasing around all kinds of stuff because you are available to do it and you're not being intentional. And, and that was one of the things that you, obviously you mentioned in your book and you mentioned it a few minutes ago is starting your morning and having purpose and having being intentional with your mornings because that's going to how your how you start your morning is how your day is going to go. So um, very, very valid. Let me ask you this, because this is something I, that I, I question from time to time. Okay. So how do you balance, and, and let me give some reference to this. In the book, you mentioned uh, Jiro Ono, 
uh, which is world famous sushi chef, right? Yes. And one of the things you said in the book is no one tells Jiro Ono how to do his job. He follows what he believes and he holds his beliefs with fierce passion. Okay. How do you balance that following a fierce passion with being a sponge? <laughs> what I love about Jiro is that he was so committed to following the process at being the best and literally saying, this is how we're going to do it. Not actually searching for more, which we all are. We want more and more and more. He's like, this is the amount of people that I can serve at our place. I'm going to make it the best sushi. And you better believe you're paying for the best sushi. It's a very expensive plate there. But he's worked to craft and craft and craft and continually, continually improve. So how do you balance that with the sponge? I think very easily. You look at your craft that you think that you can be the best at and keep following that lens in the sponge. So for instance, I'm constantly fascinated with uh, creating things that haven't been done before creating attention, which I believe attention beats marketing 1000% of the time. So I'm fascinated on reading in that lens on how to be different, how to create those things that can get people talking remarkable. I stay very deep on the sponge lens mm -hmm. while I am continually focused on utilizing that with our one drive, which is with the Savannah Bananas to hopefully bring more joy, fun, happiness, and uh, get more people going bananas out there because I think it, it brings more happiness to others. So I think there's a great balance there. The challenge, what I think, Chad, is when you read any book that's any book that you see, you just grab a book and you're like, all right, let's read this. And all of a sudden it's just like, oh, I should go do this. I should go do this. Mm -hmm. I should go do that. I think it is keeping a, a, a deep work lens into what you are putting because your input affects your output. If you are reading this, 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 all of a sudden you're going to start telling your team, you need to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And that's what a team's worst nightmare is. The, the crazy leader that's saying, hey, let's go run this way. Let's go run this way. Yeah. And so I think for us, it's, it's really the clarity and it's the mission. Our mission hasn't changed. Our core beliefs hasn't changed. Our vision every three to five years, it does change. We have a new destination that we're going, but it's all following our mission and our core beliefs. And so that's how I balance that. I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but that's how we balance it. No, I, th I think it, it does make sense is, is you want to have, you want to be a sponge because you want to be open to other ideas, right? Yes. So you want to be open to other, but also protect what you know to be true and the direction that you're heading so that you're not easily swayed and say, well, this is the latest and greatest. And so we're going to just completely change directions constantly, yes. but at least being open to those ideas. And so that when those come, when the, the ones that align with your vision or the ones that align with those, those beliefs come into play, you can adapt those into your philosophy rather than just being a closed off uh, perspective. So I, 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 yeah, I, you can act fast. And so like, for instance, like every decision on our company goes through the filter. Is it fans first? Yeah. And so it's very easy. Is this doing something for a fan? And when we have meetings, we actually have an empty chair that represents a fan. Would a fan vote for this? Would a fan want this? Mm. You know, we have big shoes that we say, these are our fan shoes. You know, Hey, you want to wear those? Will you be proud to wear those in the fan shoes? Like we have to put that in the perspective of the fan. And so when you have someone else in those meetings, it makes it clear. A lot of times those leaders, oh, that'll make more money. Oh, th th they'll buy that. Do, do, do they want that? And then they might not know the answer, but at least have a filter like, you know what? I think they would really like this. Let's try it. Let's test it. Yeah. Just a reminder, you're listening to the Coffee Break Podcast. Also, we wanted to let you know that our team puts together a weekly blog post. You can find it at locdoc.net slash blog. It's guaranteed to raise your IQ by 12 points or your money back. So it's pretty much a win-win. All right, back to the conversation. All right, I've got a, a couple more questions uh, or, or at least takeaways from the book so far. Uh, that that is there that were intriguing to me, and you mentioned uh, a lot about Uncle Walt in the book. Uh, so D Disney enjoyed selling his vision to others and put all of his energy into that goal. So that is that stood out to me because it you know as as business continues to grow, continues to change and and adapt, it's your role continues to change, and you talk about that in different areas where you tried to help build a roster and that went bad and. You've gotten involved in, you find yourself on occasion jumping into the concession stand to, to help out because you don't want the customers to have, or the, the fans to have to wait. And then yep. you realize, well, I, I, what detriment am I actually doing to this versus focusing on what I need to be? And I, I think that's one of the things that has stood out to me in a lot of 
the research that you do with with great leaders that have built amazing, huge organizations is they have found a way to focus on more so working on the vision, but then spending equal amount of time selling the vision. Because you know, mm. I, and 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 maybe that's kind of the direction that I'm understanding this is if you're if you if you just retain the vision yourself, then it doesn't do any good, right? So you're a, you're a very verbal communicator. Obviously, you can tell this by, by the way that we're the way we're going back and forth. It is important for you to be able to communicate that out to your team. But how do you make sure that you're constantly communicating a actionable plan that they mm-hmm. can execute on? Because this is something I think I struggle with a lot is talk about ideas, talk about vision, talk about this is what we want to do, this is where we want to go. But I have a hard time landing it with all of the people that I'm talking to. So how, what are the practices that you've learned? I know this is a long question. What are the practices that you've learned into communicating that vision out to your team so that they can execute on it effectively? Uh, two things here, and it's actually great timing because we just shared our uh, next five-year vision with our entire team okay. on Friday. It's past Friday. So, but number two, I, I, first, I think the greatest leaders make the least amount of decisions. Mm-hmm. And the reason they're able to do that is because they've shared the vision where they're going, that they've empowered their people to make the decisions the way they would want to and where they're going. So I, every day I try to make less decisions. That's my goal as a leader. How can I make less decisions today? How can I have our president make less decisions? And it's helped tremendously. I'm not involved in the social media like I used to be. I'm not involved in ticket sales. I'm not involved in any of that because everyone knows where we're going. So for us, um, how often is the vision shared? We struggled with this in the first. We were just trying to make ends meet. Like I said, we were sleeping on an air bed, struggling. We're just like, come on, guys. Anyone want tickets? We're doing something fun. Um, but now as we've grown and we've been able to sell it every game and, and we feel like, hey, you know, we accomplished our first goal. Mm-hmm. We came into Savannah. We saved baseball in the community. We created something that was really special. Now what's next? And so we actually wrote, we spent the last three months with our leadership team, um, which in perspective, we're not a huge team. It's myself, my wife, uh, our president, and two others. We have you know, there's literally only five of us. Mm -hmm. And we went through and said, all right, let's map the vision. Let's talk about what it is for our team, what it is for our product, what it is for how we're going to promote and what it is for the impact. And we all wrote it. We all had it. And we went through it in line. And then I, as the the founder, put all that together and what I believed and said, this is where we are going. And we spent an entire afternoon Friday, shared it with our staff. We did, we had a a presentation. We had uh, each section, we had food and drinks. We had fun too. And we, we shared it. And now we share it every day. So in the staff chat, we talk about, guys, remember bananas, 365, 24, seven, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. And we simplify some of the main points of it. So they know what's happening. And I think what happens is vision for so many leaders, it's constantly changing. Well, let's go build this. Let's go try this. But there's no clear direction that people don't know where to go mm-hmm. and they don't know what their actions are. So I think Spend time writing a narrative. Deep work. Instead of just saying, all right, we want to build, write it. Because the more you write, the more clarity you'll have. We spent hours and hours and hours writing and working to finally say, we are all in on this for the leadership team. And then then we shared it. Now we're going to produce a video on it. And we're going to keep talking about it over. And we're sharing it to the public because we want to hold it accountable. So basically, in two to three weeks, we're going to put it I'll be out there. This is where we're going in the next three to five years. Because if you share your vision with enough people, you'll have enough people that will help you mm. accomplish your vision. Mm. And I think that's very important. Yeah, getting it out there and people will, are willing to help. But I think the accountability part is, is very valid as well. If, if it's out there, then at least that's the looming uh, motivator for that. Another th- and one thing, Chad, too, one thing too, hiring. If you're hiring, mm-hmm. don't lead with the job and the role, lead with the vision. Sure. Hey, this is where we're going. You'll have people that either don't want to be a part of this or they do, but you don't just say, Hey, this is a job paying this. This is what it like. If they don't want to be on the bus, good luck what they can do. Yeah. Follow where they want to go. Lead with the vision. My biggest fear is settling. <laughs> that was one of the lines in the book. And I, I have had that conversation with so many different people recently. That's I, I share that fear with you. How, how is that just an innate thing that, that it, you know, now, and so you're constantly you're constantly striving to, to be a sponge, to continue to grow, continue yeah. to share vision. Is that part of it? Or is, it, is there some other factor of why that is such a, a big fear for you? <laughs> well, we could get really deep into some therapy sessions here and go deep into it. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think there's things that drive us to certain ways. And, you know, for instance, my parents, uh, 
you know, we're divorced as a kid. I was only child. My mother had a drug problem. Uh, it was just my father and everything I had to do. Uh, I got praised when I did something good. And so literally I was fighting for the love of my dad to try to accomplish things. And that drove me to be successful. And even today I'm still trying to make my dad proud. And uh, I think that's something that's driven me. And I'm sure, I don't know if you and your team have done Enneagrams, but you know, the Enneagram and learning about who you are. And, you know, I, I learned I'm a strong three, even though I, people want me to be a seven. And I think I want to be a seven and be all about happiness and fun, which I am. I'm still driven by that success. That won't change. That's been built in me. I'm always going to be driven by success. Uh, if I ever feel like I'm standing still, mm -hmm. um, I'm struggling. And so it's the awareness that now allows me to take a big step forward and or take a um, zoom out. And I think us as leaders, if your your big fear is settling, zoom out. And what I've done before, when I was going through challenging times, I zoomed out and said, Jesse, look what you've done and you've been a part of over the last five years. You've bought a team, you've sold a team, you've, start, you've spoke all over the world. You've done these all these things that were nice that you feel like, I didn't do anything today. I didn't yeah. make progress today. And you have to zoom out. And so as soon as I zoom out and start writing some of these things, and you know, to be honest with you, the most, little thing that we all can do that helped me with that is the thank you experiment. And I started this in 2016. You'll get there in the book. But I, read it, I started writing a thank you letter every single day to someone. And literally, I have them everywhere. And yes, of course, they're yellow. Um, but I, I write a thank you letter every day. And to people that have made an impact in my life. And I'll tell you this, it's probably been the most selfish thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. As weird as that sounds, yeah. I get so much joy out of writing to someone how much they made an impact in my life. And that makes me zoom out a little bit and not be so worried about potentially settling because I'm still spreading some joy every little day, even just one thank you letter. Yeah. Okay. So that, that is, I'm, I'm just kind of processing all of this right now because, <laughs> you, right? The, the the awareness helps to with a fear of settling and understanding at points. And I think this is the part that people struggle with. It, maybe it's just me struggles with the fear of settling is there is a, a lack of ability intentionally or not to step back and look more at where you are in comparison to where you've come from versus where you are in comparison to where you want to be. And I think that's what you just said, is you zoom out and look at all the accomplishments that have happened so that you can say, okay, I, I wasn't a failure today. I, I, actually have, I actually have made progress. And so having the ability to step back and look at where you've come from to where you are now, but also not losing sight of where you want to go, which yeah, is very and important. Don't compare yourself to others. That's, that's the, it takes away. That's the biggest challenge right now. We start comparing everyone else and seeing their highlights. Very, very interesting. All right. Um, so why do you wear a yellow suit? <laughs> uh, did you play any sports as a kid? I, I, I played basketball a little bit. Okay. Um, well, anybody that plays sports, they know there's a difference between wearing your practice shorts, your practice shirt versus wearing your uniform. Mm. Hold on a second. Mindset. Hold on a second. Let's pause on that for a minute. There you go. That's big. <laughs> That's a big yes. statement. Well, it, it wasn't intentionally to be a big statement, but there's a big difference there. And for me, especially influenced by P.T. Barnum, I realized that if I showed up like every day wearing just the same polo, the same shorts, the same practice stuff, and then tried to entertain our fans, I wasn't channeling um, the type of entertainment show I should be giving them, the type of energy I should be giving them. So I was inspired by P.T. I got a, a, a tuxedo, a black tuxedo the first night with tails and a big top hat. It was 101 degrees and I almost melted. It was, it was brutal. And I found the yellow tuxedo and I uh, bought one at brightcoloredtuxedos.com. And the next day, the next game, everyone was wanted pictures. And they were like, here's the guy in the yellow tuxedo. I became just the yellow tux guy. Like people would call our offices, the yellow tux guy there. I didn't even have a name anymore. I was just the yellow tux guy. And uh, what it really has stood for, it, it's, it's been my uniform. When I put this on, it means it's showtime. Yeah. Just like when I put on my sports uniform, it means it's game time. And we teach our people to always be on stage. There's a difference between behind scenes, behind stage, and being on stage. And so even right now with you, you know, this is, I'm on stage. This is my uniform. If I'm sharing what we're doing, if I'm just like, yeah, I'm in my bedroom, you know, just, and it, that's not right. And, and, and it's how do you show up as a leader? So this has been my uniform. It's the one thing that makes me stand out and amplifies me. It doesn't fit for everyone else, but you can tell I'm high energy. I'm a little crazy. I'm not right in the head with a lot of things. Like this is me and I'm okay with it. And I think this is who I am and this is why I want to share it. I like it. That, that's, that's the title of your next book, right? 
you, you've got to figure out how to how to how to simplify it. But uh, the difference between your practice shorts and putting on your uniform that's that's impactful. It, I mean, we could spend a whole another hour breaking that down because there's there's a lot of truth in what you just said, and being because it, it goes back to intentionality. Like you're being when you put that on, you you know what your goal is, you know what your mission is, and it helps you stay focused because you can't easily neglect the fact that you have a yellow tuxedo on. Like that's like you you can't avoid that. And so it can really, really bring you back to being uh, intentional with your with your mission. Yeah. So and, and I'll share a, a friend of mine who uh, wrote a book that is on the exact concept and it's brilliant. And I think you love it is the alter ego effect. Yep. And he shared how all the greatest performers Todd uh, Todd Herman, the greatest performers do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They actually have something that they put on and they know they're Lady Gaga. I mean, Beyonce, they all have this mindset. They have a different personality. Yeah. Even Kobe Bryant before, you know, the Mamba, they yeah. all had different personalities and that's it. For mine, it's a visual. Sure. But for some, it's just this mindset that they take. I think it's so important. Some type of a routine that gets them prepped for that. The, the, the last little side thing, and I'll, I'll close on this because I want to be mindful of our time and we've gone really long, but it's been very impactful. So uh, I know I know people have stayed engaged with it. You mentioned in your book that you that you wrote uh, that you were not a big reader as a kid, uh, and almost very painful to the point where you had you cried when you had to read a book. I can very much align with that. That was I was definitely not a reader as a kid. I absolutely hated it. I hated the the whole process and thought process behind it. But I realized at a point through trying to be a better leader and trying to build a business that it was a valuable asset to continue to learn and kind of be that sponge. What is that advice that you give to people? Because I have, I still have conversations with people that are, that are, that are in, in these types of positions that are, ah, I don't have time to do that. Or, I don't have the attention to do that. What is your, what is your advice for people that are, you say, Hey, there's a lot of information here and, and how can you make it valuable? This will be tough. They don't love it enough. Yeah, they don't yeah. love it enough. If you're not willing and willing or open to reading more, to listen to podcasts or doing things um, in regards to your job, your career, potentially your calling, your passion, you don't love it enough. Yeah. And, 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 and it's a tough, tough conversation to have because I am obsessed and you can look at obsession in a good way and a bad way. I'm obsessed with it because it brings so much joy to me. And I feel it every day when a fan drives 40 hours and a family to come to a game this summer, 40 hours. And they just drove for the game. They were leaving the next morning. They're like, we had to come here. We had to see this. I feel I have a moral obligation to make it a better experience and to spread it to more people. Mm. And so if you don't feel that, then I understand. We have people on our team that love to read in regards to the business because they're so passionate about it. We have others that it doesn't, hey, this is a job for them. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just saying, find something that you maybe love so much that you want to keep learning about it. You want to keep digging in. You want to keep growing with it because it fires you up and you feel you're letting people down if you don't know more about it. That's, that's kind of what's led me. Because when in school, I didn't care about chemistry or biology or you know, English literature. Mm. Like I had no passion. On Why would I want to read it? Yeah. And so I don't blame any other employees or team members that don't want to read about business because they don't love it as much. Very true. That's, that's impactful. Jesse, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you responding uh, to my message on LinkedIn. And um, it's, been, it's been awesome to, to chat with you for the past hour or so. Um, if there's ever anything that, that we can do for you or anything that I can do for you, please let us know because uh, the information that you're sharing, and I appreciate the, the, the fact that you wrote this book because uh, it's very practical. It's something I can align with. It's something that a lot of other business owners can align with. And so uh, I, I appreciate you putting it out there and, and being willing to share that story with others. No, thanks so much. It was a fun conversation. I appreciate you, Chad. Hey, Jesse, thank you very much again for uh, taking the time to, to co converse with us today. I've learned a lot. I've got a page full of notes, uh, some practical takeaways from the book that I've already do dove into, uh, and I would definitely recommend that. We'll put a link in all of the description, so hopefully uh, you can go and get that. I've got it on Kindle, but you can also order it on Amazon. It's, it's all there for you. Some of the great takeaways that I have and, and I mentioned that there at the end, there's a big difference between wearing your practice shorts and putting on your uniform. Um, and also, how do you become the only in your industry? I think those are really challenging points for all of us to work towards. So thank you very much for your time today. If this is your first time watching or listening to the podcast, we definitely invite you to subscribe. I just got a message earlier on LinkedIn. Somebody said, found the podcast and I'm subscribed. You can do the same by going to lockdoc.net slash podcast. There are subscription links there for all of the major podcast platforms, but we also do this in video form as well, and it's available on YouTube and Facebook. 
Just search for LOC, DOC, and podcast, and it will definitely come up for you. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time right here on the Coffee Break Podcast.